Well, this morning we're going to wrap up chapter 4 of 1 John. And while certainly the chapter and verse numbers in the text uh, here are not what John had originally written, there were no chapter and verse numbers back in the first century in the text, but it seems like a fitting place for us to pause until after the new year. Certainly we have Christmas next week, and, and then we're going to start, uh, start a fresh year, 2017. But at the end of 1 John 4, it brings us to an interesting place. Because not only does John restate the same truths he's been working through in this letter, and he's been laboring to teach us certain things all throughout the entire course of this letter, it brings us face to face with one of the most challenging and humbling truths in all of Scripture. Now in order to frame these truths in a way that we can uh, engage with, I want to sort of pose two questions for you to consider this morning. And those two questions are, are in your sermon outline, and so as you listen and work through, you can certainly make notes and and think through the text with me as we go through. But here's two of the questions that we're going to see answered in this text. I'll give them to you. Number one, who initiates our relationship with God? Who initiates this relationship that we have with Him? And the second question builds off of that, and what is our Christian responsibility toward other people? What is our responsibility? And we're going to see that those two things are very much so related. But before we turn to those questions, let's look at 1 John 4. If you uh, grab one of those Bibles out of the pews, if you don't have one, it's toward the end. 1 John. We spent several weeks working through these verses, but as with most, most letters, they're meant to be read all together. When you get a letter in the mail, you don't read it over the course of uh, a year, <laughs> even though we work through a letter in the Bible over the course of a long period of time. Uh, you know, you sit down, you read it in one sitting, and so we have to keep that in mind as we're working through the text. But certainly, as we move through the Scriptures, methodically and slowly, we don't want to miss the brilliance and the sheer magnitude of God's Word. This morning we're going to look at verses 19, 20, and 21, but I want to look at this whole passage. So we're going to read the whole passage this morning. We're going to look at it. So look at at the scripture with me. We're going to start in 1 John 4, verse 7. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment." And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from Him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now before we get to our verses, I want to engage in a little biblical theology. In other words, I want to examine and sort of summarize some of the doctrine we get from this passage. 
And, and we've been working through this for the last several weeks, and so this should not be a surprise to you if you've been with us and been listening. But first we see that God is love in verses 8 and also in verse 16. He is love. The word in the Greek is agape. It's the word for love, but it's more than the love that we understand culturally. Truthfully, when we talk about biblical love, the world really doesn't understand what love is in terms of agape. In truth, agape, the Greek word for love, is a selfless love. It's a love that gives and a love that serves others. It's a love that actually regards other people as higher and more important than ourself. The world's love is very self-centered. I love and I feel love for someone else, but biblical love is actually a regard for the needs and desires of other people, not ourselves. Very, very different. And so John is saying that God is the perfection of such love. And John characterizes God by that love. He says God is so much wrapped up in this concept of love, he says God is love. He's not talking about the metaphysical qualities. God isn't made of, you know, spirit and love. It's not like that. He's he's speaking sort of metaphorically here. But God is the perfection of such love. And not only does God love perfectly, but we also learn that He actually invented love. God invented love. Look at verse 7. He says, love is from God. All love, true love, is from God. He is the originator and He is the creator of love. But love is only love if it's put into action, as we'll see. And so we see how God demonstrates that love for us. Well, how does He do it? How does God show and demonstrate that He has love? The Bible says it's in the sending of His Son. Verse 9, look at verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God initiates this action. It it starts with God. Verse 10, And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is the atoning sacrifice, the appeasement of God for our sake. We think about atoning for sin, the concept of atoning, atonement for sin. Christ is the one who atones for our sin. He is the propitiation of God's wrath. So not only did God create love out of thin air, He chose to demonstrate that love by sending His only Son, and further, He sent His Son to die for us, even though we were the ones who sinned against Him, and we are the ones who are deserving of death. But why? why? Why would God do this? If we are deserving of punishment, if we are deserving of wrath because of sin, why would God send His Son? Well, the answer is because He loved us. Because He loves. He sent His perfect, beloved Son, Jesus, to die for sin, to, to stand in our place, to suffer our punishment, to satisfy the wrath of God, to make forgiveness possible, and to usher in a peace between God and man. That is what Jesus has done for His bride. Not only did He send His Son to be the Savior of the world in verse 14, He also sent His Holy Spirit, verse 13. He sent us to partake of His Spirit, He says. The Spirit who regenerates us, makes us born again. The Spirit of God who indwells us, works and actually takes up residence in our soul. The Spirit of God who seals us, who works to sanctify us, to cleanse us. Now all throughout this letter, we are commanded by God, he says, if all these things are true, and they are, he says, if that's the case, we are commanded to now abide in Him. We are to remain in Him, to stay close to Him. There is no room for spiritual laziness in the Christian life. We are to stay close to God. And certainly the overall passage, or the the, the context of, of this passage, is that God is the originator of all of this. That's the, the point, is that God is the one who's doing this. But this context, this 
idea of God reaching out across the time and space and the universe to reach us, this is supposed to be a comfort for us. Because God is working in us. And by doing so, His love is being perfected in us. And that in turn gives us confidence, verse 17, confidence for the day of judgment. And by doing so, that effectively casts out fear. So to restate, God is working. He originates love. He sends His Son. He redeems the church. He redeems His bride. And therefore, it gives us confidence. All fear has been cast out. And now we stand before God, justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. He is the one who has done this. And now we're not standing on our own two feet saying, God, look at what we've done. We say, God, look what you've done. Very, very different than the message we often hear. If anybody of any one of us had to stand alone before God on Judgment Day and face the consequences of our own sin, none of us would survive. None of us. The Bible says there is not one righteous, not even one. But God, believers, God, God in His great love has sent His Son to save us. He sent His Spirit to regenerate us, and He has given us His Word by which we are sanctified. And so again, we pose these questions. Looking at this passage and sort of seeing the thrust behind it, looking at this passage, we say, okay, well, if that's the case, then who initiates our relationship with God? Where does this come from? Where does this start from? I want to give you a little bit of historical background There's a man who was born in 360 A.D. His name was Pelagius. And he was was a devout man. He was a moral man. He tried to live ethically and righteously. And he believed and taught that the responsibility of every single human being on planet Earth was to live a moral life. And everybody who listened to this teaching said, yes, amen. We are to live righteously. We are to do the right thing. And that sounds right, and it is right. To, to, to be righteous, to live righteously. That is until a pastor named Augustine began to examine the theology of this man and read what he was writing and listen to him intently. And it seemed the reason Pelagius believed and pushed for the need for such good works is because he was actually in denial of the doctrine of original sin. He believed that all of us were born innocent, completely with, with no tie to Adam's sin at all. He believed that all humans were born good, and it was only by their later actions that they corrupted themselves. So we're born with a clean slate, and then we kind of ruin it. So he says, if that's the case, if we're born with a clean slate, you have to live righteously. And if you can live righteously your whole life and not commit sins, then you're going to go to heaven. Further, he believed and taught that It was by sheer human will alone that humans were able to live a sinless life. And certainly he claimed that God's grace worked in people and sort of assisted people in their deeds. But in the end, people are innately capable of accomplishing their own righteousness. We know that's not what the Bible teaches, though. Pelagius would later be declared a heretic in the Council of Carthage in 411 A.D. He was, they pled with him, please consider, recant your statements, recant your, your teaching. This is wrong. And he says, I will not recant. And so he was excommunicated. And certainly Pelagianism, as we know it, certainly died at least in that form by the 5th century. But now we have this view that's come into fruition known as semi-Pelagianism. Even now, there are whole movements, there are whole churches that embrace this teaching. Just one off the top of my head, the one that comes to mind is, right now, the Roman Catholic Church teaches a form of semi-Pelagianism. That salvation and sanctification, the origin of that begins with us. That it's a joint work between us and God that we are somehow having a hand in this salvation. That by doing certain kinds of things, we are striving, we say, with God. But in the end, it's our responsibility. 
And growth in faith is a work of God by grace. Therefore, this teaching would say that salvation only comes through the church and only comes through good works and good deeds in and through the church. In fact, Canon 9 of the Council of Trent says, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain grace of justification, let him be anathema. And so the question then persists for us as we think through these things, and again, this is a very popular doctrine, as we think through these things, who is initiating our relationship with God? Look at 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atonement, the sacrifice for sin, the appeasement of wrath. He has been the propitiation for our sins. John answers that teaching right away. And so as not to miss the point again in verse 19, look at verse 19. We love because He first loved us. In fact, we see this taught by Jesus in John 15. If you have your Bible open and ready, go to John 15. John 15. We spent several months going through the Gospel of John, or actually a couple years in John, but several months in John 13 through 17. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, culminating in the high priestly prayer. These are called, this is the upper room discourse, or close to it. And here in this discourse, chapter 15, Jesus is describing the nature of his relationship to his bride. And he uses kind of a garden analogy. Jesus is a master of language and of image and metaphor. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just, just beautifully peppered with metaphor and symbols and imagery. And Jesus continues that in his teaching. And he uses this analogy, and he says that he is a vine, a vine. And he says, and my father is the vine dresser. And he says, the believers, the church, Christians are the branches. And by which this metaphor works, he says, we're commanded to abide in him, in verse 5. And then he explains, look at verse 9. As the father has loved me, So have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name he may give to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. But Jesus here says that the origin of the relationship lies with Him. He says, I am the vine. He is the one who commands. And He says, you didn't choose me. You didn't show up and find me out and say, we want to be your disciples. He went out and He says, "I, I want you. I chose you. It is the Lord who draws people to Himself. We see this taught by the apostles. Even in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And in verse 48, we read, when the Gentiles heard this, they heard the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And he says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. God was drawing people to Himself. God is initiating. He's appointing and the question always arises, yeah, but don't, aren't we free to choose God first? Like, isn't it up to us? Aren't we responsible for this decision? But the Bible teaches that apart from God, this is impossible. 
Apart from God, we are spiritually dead in our sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And further, we're not just dead, but Romans 5 says that we're actually enemies of God. We're not friends at that point, like Jesus is talking about in John 15. He says, now I've called you my friends. But before we have faith in Christ, he says, we're enemies of the cross. We're objects of wrath in Roman, or excuse me, Ephesians 2. However, in Romans 5, 8, it says this. It's beautiful. But God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of the cross, while we were sinners, while we were dead in our sins, He came and died for us. It's beautiful. We were dead. We were rebels. We were marked out for destruction. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Here it is. In love. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace. He loved us before the foundation of the world. He loved us before we loved Him. He loved us before we could do anything good. And He loved us apart from anything we have done to deserve it. But I mean, Isn't that a marvelous thought? Isn't that a a humbling thought. I mean, as Americans, we are so bent on our choice and our vote and our freedom and our whatever. But Christianity is that, no, God has done this. God is the one who redeems. God is the one who saves and comforts and ministers and rescues and heals. God is the one. He gets the glory. Paul says this to the praise of His glorious grace. That's comforting to know that God has done this. There was an an English pastor named John Cotton who was a Puritan. He actually came to New England in 1633 to minister in Boston. Before he left England, though, he actually preached through all of 1 John. I actually just got his lectures his sermons in the mail the other day and it's just fascinating it's amazing that he's done this i kind of feel like i'm in good company here but here's here's what he had to say about this verse john cotton writes there is no work of god in us which does not work in our hearts in like work if god chooses us for himself then we choose him for our god god's election of us stamps in us an election of him God, has God purchased us at a high cost? And the answer is yes. Then we learn to purchase Him at a high cost. Though it be at a loss of all we have, God calls us sons, we call Him Father. God works and we respond. And we must respond. But this spiritual truth doesn't come with no obligation. We aren't just saved to sit. God's love is perfected in us and it's meant to produce something through us. Second question, what is our Christian responsibility toward other people? And and John provides sort of a scenario. If you want to go back to 1 John, he provides kind of a scenario here in verse 20. We've seen this a couple times throughout the letter, but look at verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is very similar. Just dart your your eyes over. This is very similar to chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light in him. There is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness because he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 
John is illustrating this again in chapter 3. He talks about this in terms of Cain and Abel, where Cain hates his brother so much that he murders him. And John says in verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And he says, and you know that no murderer will enter or has eternal life abiding in him. So now he gives an illustration of this truth. But this has been a repeated theme. And John is repeating it again here at the end of chapter 4 in order to summarize it. If you look again at verse 20, we see, if you're looking at your Bible here, that there is a discrepancy between what a person says versus what a person does. What they say versus what they do. Look at it. First, what they say. If anyone says, I love God. Okay? If anyone says that, and truthfully, lots of people say this. We hear this all the time. They say it in different ways, though. For some, it might come in the form of just claiming the name of Jesus. They say, oh, I'm praying this or I'm believing this in Jesus' name. And they'll claim his name for themselves. We might do this by just claiming the title of Christian. The vast majority of Americans check the box and claim that they are Christians. They claim the name of Christ. They, they claim to know God and love God. Even though it seems like that's the number that we see reported is not really what's here. So many people say they love God, but they, they don't, they're unrecognizable as Christians. It's very strange. Some people might even be devout. They might even be in church every single Sunday and they say, I love God. I love God so much I go to church every week. People might No Bible verses. They might be well-versed in Christian doctrine. They might be the most spiritually-minded person you know. They might even just be a person out in the street, a pagan, who says, well, I'm good with God. He's good with me. I know God. I love God. Sure. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Even Gandhi said, I love your Jesus. I just don't love your Christians. So Gandhi was cool with Jesus. So their profession is one of love, for God. But then if you look at it, here's the situation. Their profession is love, but by their actions, their actions are one of hatred. John says, if this is true, but yet they hate their brother. What do you call it when what you say and what you do are polar opposites? What is that called? You're a hypocrite. It's called hypocrisy. But John actually cuts a little bit deeper. He says, if you do this, if you say one thing and and live another way, he says, you're a liar. He calls him a liar. And to borrow from the beginning of chapter 1, to claim that you're doing righteousness and yet you practice wickedness, he says, not only are you a liar, but the truth is not in you. You do not practice the truth. And John, we've got to love this about John, he's speaking in no uncertain terms. John doesn't mix words. Have we seen him mince words once? No, he's very direct. This letter is painful to read and to go through because he's so cutting with his words. And the objection would have to be, have to do with kind of a a hypothetical person and say, yeah, but what does my relationship to God have anything to do with you? What does my relationship to God have to do with anybody else? It's my relationship with God. That's a common thing we hear. God knows me. Just because you don't like what I'm doing or what I'm saying or what I'm thinking or what I'm believing, just because you don't like how I'm living, God knows me. This this concept of a a personal relationship to God. Now certainly in our context and and culture, we understand what that phrase means. It's talking about a, a relationship to God that must be personal. We don't get saved in groups here. It has to be a person's Faith in Jesus. That's what personal relationship means. Once you're saved, though, you don't live in a vacuum. I know that we're all individuals here, but but we are a church. We are a body of believers. The Bible teaches that once you're saved, you're not just saved to an island, you're saved into a body. Why do you think he uses the word body? Because we're hands and feet. And we are supposed to work together. I mean, your hand doesn't go mutiny against the rest of your body, does it? I mean, your legs don't do something different than what your brain says. Your body works together. We are saved 
into a body of believers. You're placed into a church to which you have a responsibility, and dare I say, an obligation to bear fruit. We are obliged by God to bear fruit. You cannot live in a bubble as a Christian. It doesn't work. And so the objection that John raises, it's dealing with this claim that a person can love God, but yet not care about other people. That they can love God and actually effectively hate people. That that is somehow possible. To which John employs the use of a tactic known as a fortiori. What does that mean? It's an argument from lesser to greater. The idea that if you have two arguments, one lesser, one greater, and you want to argue for the strength of the greater position, you can actually prove that argument without a shadow of a doubt using the lesser position. Let me give you an example, all right? A 16-year-old son borrows his dad's razor without asking, okay? He's in the bathroom, he says, oh, that's dad's. He grabs it and starts using his razor. The dad finds out about it and he gets angry. He says, I don't want you taking my stuff without asking. And and this becomes a big, huge deal in the house. Don't take my razor. All right? And he gets bitter about it. A week later, the son goes and takes his dad's Mustang for a drive without asking. When he arrives home, he pulls in the driveway and he sees his dad standing there with his arms folded. And the son gets out of the car and he asks the famous question, are you mad? And the father, who is about to employ a fortiore, argues from the lesser to the greater. And he says, son, if I was angry with you about you stealing my razor, how much more angry do you think I'll be for you stealing my car? And we know that the point is that the kid is fried. There's just no way out of this one. But we can understand this, can't we? If this is true, and I'm mad, how much bigger is this? And the kid's going to say, yeah, I see the point. That's the technique that John is going to use here. This technique, and this is something that Scripture writers use pervasively. Jesus uses this all the time. If this is true, how much more is this true? Here it goes. Here's the lesser. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen. This is the lesser, okay? Because the argument is that if you can, you can love God without loving your neighbor. But here's the thing. His brother, his neighbor, his brother is someone he can see, he can talk to, he can interact with. There's, there's a tangible relationship. He can actually meet real needs. He can actually have a real relationship in person. He can touch the person, hug the person. And he reasons, if you can't effectively love a person who is standing right in front of you, here comes the greater, then you cannot possibly love a God whom you've never seen. You see that? Don't go telling people that you love God if you can't be loving to your neighbor. He says you have no business doing it. It's impossible. I mean, if you, if you don't love your kids, if you're nasty to your wife, if you're contentious to your husband, if you're vile to your boss, if you're uncaring toward your neighbor, if, if you gossip about your so-called friends, if you can't love the people that you can see, then believers, it's going to be impossible for you to love a God whom you've never seen. Rather, your genuine love for God becomes evident to the people in your life if your love for them is bountiful. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a reputation for being a caring person? Think about your reputation. Think about what people would say about you. If I went out and polled 100 people who know you, and I asked them, what do you think of so-and-so? Do you have a reputation for being a loving person? Do you have a reputation for being a giving person? If that's not the case, if everybody who knows you would say, they're they're terrible, they're not loving at all, they're they're kind of mean to me, If, if you have a reputation for not loving other people, do the church a favor and stop telling people you're a Christian. 
Because verse 20 says that if you do this, if you do this, you say you love God, but yet hate your neighbor, he says you're a liar, his word, you're a liar, a hypocrite, and you're better off repenting of having a bad heart and learning how to love people for real. This is the command, verse 21, that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is a command. A command from the Lord God. This cuts right to the heart of the matter. When Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? There's so many out there we're talking about. What's the greatest one, Jesus? And what does he say? He gives two. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Right? That's it. And they say, well, that, that's right. And then he says, but knowing that this can only be done this way, he says the second is like it. Jesus could have stopped, and that would have been sufficient for them. He could have stopped, but he didn't. He says, that's the first. He says, the second is like it. And he's quoting from Leviticus 19. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two are connected. They're connected. In fact, Jesus said in John 13, 35, that loving one another proves to the world that we love God and belong to Him. It proves that we're His disciples. They'll know that you're a Christian if you have love for one another. When people look at this body of believers, when they look at one another, they look at us, if they see infighting, if they see gossip and slander, if they see a cold heart toward each other's needs, if we don't pray for each other, if we don't serve each other, if, if the world sees that, it doesn't just hurt this church. In fact, that's the lesser. It defames the name of God. But if the world sees a church that loves one another, then they'll know we're His disciples and they'll praise God because of us. It's so important. So how is it that we're even able to love one another? So do we just drum it up from within ourselves? I mean, do we just say, I'm going to love and you just kind of Muster up the strength to love? Is that how this works? No. We love, he says, verse 19, because God first loved us. Well, how much did he love us? He loved us so much that he sent his son into the world. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Because God has sent his son into the world. The God-man, Jesus Christ, who was descended from heaven, took on the form of a human being. He was born as a baby to Mary, the virgin at the time. He came to the world. He grew up in it. He lived life to the fullest, and he did it perfectly. Never once sinned. Accomplished a a righteous life. He, He kept every law of God. He accomplished perfection. And then out of love, He says, no greater love exists than to lay down your your life for someone else, for your friends. Out of love, He gave Himself up, willingly. And He went to the cross. A Roman cross. Was nailed there, suffered, and died. And when He was on the cross, He bore the full punishment for our sin. The full punishment. He satisfied the wrath of God that was being stored up against us. The objects of wrath. He shed His blood as an atoning sacrifice. And He did so in the place of sinners. Believers, we must get this. I know I say this just about every week. Think on these things this year. Why did Jesus come? Why did He come to earth? Why was that a big deal? Because of what He's accomplished for us. It's something only He could have done. He died for us. He was buried for us. And then He rose to life for us to bring life to believers. That is the true Christmas miracle is that God would even do this. That He would come to earth and die for His people. Why? Why did He do this? Because God loved us first. And in response to the grace and the love of God, we repent of our sin. We we put our faith in Christ. We, we, We place our trust in Him. We believe, and the Bible says, by that we are saved. So the question for you this morning is, have you ever trusted in Christ 
to save you from your sins. There's nothing we can accomplish on our own in this life that's going to do it. I can't atone for my own sins. Every time I do something good over here, i got five bad things over here. I can't tip the scales, and neither can you. Have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ? Confess your sin to Him. Put your faith alone in Him. That's what He's calling every single person to do. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we come to You and we... We know that you are the one who does this work. Father, I I don't understand how you choose us and yet command us to believe and trust you. I don't understand the, 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 the conundrum of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. I don't see it. I don't understand it. But Father, I know the Bible teaches both. That you command us to believe and to abide and to repent and to live righteously for you. But then you comfort us with the truth that you are the one who's working in us. Praise be your name, God. That you do a mighty work in the hearts of people. And by all standard of human righteousness, you shouldn't. But by your standard, by your great love, you do. You do something that none of us would even do for our best friends, and yet you've done it for your enemies. What a great God you are, Father, that you would consider even one of us, that you would mark us out and deliver us from certain death. What an amazing love. My heart can't comprehend it, Father. But we must And I pray, I plead with you, Lord, that you would work in the hearts of these people. And for anybody who's even at home who's with us, that you would work in their hearts and draw them back to you here. That we could fellowship together, but draw them to yourself. Help us not to forget what we're doing and who we're doing it for. God, what an amazing gift you've given in giving us your Son. Impossible to comprehend. But praise be to your name that you have saved us, that you've forgiven sin, and you've granted us eternal life and granted us adoption and granted us to be heirs of your kingdom. That's an amazing. So thank you, God, for your wondrous love. We bless your name even now, and we do so in the name of Jesus. Amen.